Let's move on to our next questioner. At the microphone over there, Mr. Edelman. Welcome to America, Mr. Mandela. I'm Ken Edelman. Those of us who share your struggle for human rights and against apartheid have been somewhat disappointed by the models of human rights that you have held up since being released in jail. You've met over the last six months three times with Yasser Arafat, who you have praised. You have told Gaddafi that you share the view on, and applaud him on his record of human rights and his drive for freedom and peace around the world. And you have praised Fidel Castro as a leader of human rights and said that Cuba was one of the countries that's head and shoulders above all other countries in human rights, despite the fact that documents of the United Nations and elsewhere show that Cuba is one of the worst. I was just wondering, are these your models of leaders of human rights? And if so, would you want a that we can and we will never do. We have our own struggle which we are conducting. We are grateful to the world for supporting our struggle. But nevertheless, we are an independent organization with its own policy. And the attitude of every country towards our attitude towards any country is determined by the attitude of that country to our struggle. Yasser Arafat, Colonel Gaddafi, Fidel Castro, support our struggle to the hilt. There is no reason whatsoever why we should have any hesitation about hailing their commitment to human rights as they are being demanded in South Africa. Our attitude is based solely on the fact that they fully support the anti-apartheid struggle. They do not support it only in rhetoric. They are placing resources at our disposal for us to win this fight. That is the position. <laughs> so why are you so insistent upon maintaining sanctions at a time when it can be argued that the South African government has made more concessions, your release being only one of them, than it has ever made in the past 40 years? I should know better about this matter, Mr. Coppel, than you. <laughs> no doubt. After all, it is the ANC, not the government, that is responsible for the present talks. We have been hammering the government since 1986 to meet us, and in, and in spite of the humiliating and insulting conditions they tried to impose on us, before they could agree to meeting us, we nevertheless had sufficient patience and sufficient commitment to peace as to continue hammering them to meet us. They have eventually done so, but despite the fact that the talks are now uh, on, apartheid is still in place. The police are still killing our people, as they've done over the years. Vigilante groups are openly arming themselves for the specific purpose of attacking progressive groups and progressive leaders. The right wing 
is also arming itself openly and they say they are doing so for the purpose of destroying the ANC. They are calling for some of us to be hanged. Why would you think that we should now relax our strategies? What has happened? Let's move on to the next question. Amanta. My name is Gloria Tude. I was born here in Harlem. I'm a lawyer. I've lived here all my life. I'm also on the board of directors of uh, the African Educational Foundation that's raising money to train the people of Africa for industry. I am concerned about the future economy of South Africa. I am concerned when I look at the newer countries that gained their freedom so hard fought, indeed did not demonstrate sound fiscal policy. Illiteracy is still quite large and hunger. What <clears throat> if, if I may... What if... we want, what we want to achieve is a healthy and vibrant economy which can ensure full employment to our people, maximum production, and the development of social justice. We wanted to rectify the imbalances that exist in our economy. One of the companies, well-known companies in the country, one company owns more than 75% of the shares quoted in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. This is illustrative of how our economy is organized. It is more, the, the, the resources of the country are monopolized by a white minority, even in that minority by a few individuals, whereas the masses of the people, especially blacks, are left poor, ridden with disease, illiteracy, without educational facilities, we wanted to develop an economy which will put an end to that and will leave to other people to put a label if they so wish. Uh, Mr. Mandela, as I told you before we began this broadcast, uh, almost all the questions will be coming here from the audience, but we also went to a couple of people back in South Africa, told them you were going to be on the broadcast, and asked them if they had any questions for you or comments that they wanted to make to you. One of those from whom we are about to hear now, and I'd like you to address your attention over to that monitor, is a man by the name of Koos van der Merwe, who's one of the leaders of the Conservative Party. Have a listen to what he has to say. Hello, Nelson. I'm a South African. I'm an Afrikaner. I want self-determination for my people in a part of South Africa. You can't have the whole South Africa for yourself. A part of it belongs to my people. Nelson, you're not going to nationalize the assets of the white people. I have worked for my banks, my mines, my businesses, and my farms. You are not going to take it. Stop your violence. Stop your sanction campaign. Stop your nonsense. Leave the violent campaign alone and come and sit down, become a normal person, and talk, and maybe that way we can find solutions. And lastly, forget communism, Nelson, it's gone. And I hope you will be well. I believe you were ill. I hope you will recover and have a good journey. Ik hoop van harte dat een dag ik de geleendheid zal krijgen om met u te gezellig. Ja. Well, just to interpret Please. what I said, <laughs> I just wanted to demonstrate that I am bilingual. All I have said 
to Kuas van der Merwe is to say, I am happy to know you. I hope that one day we shall have the opportunity to discuss the affairs of our country. Mr. Mandela, as I mentioned to you before the program, we also have some distinguished guests sitting behind us, uh, one of whom, uh, Mr. Henry Sigmund, together with two other Jewish leaders, came to Geneva to visit with you precisely because they were so concerned not only by the kind of thing that you just said before the break with regard to Yasser Arafat, with regard to uh, Libya's Colonel Gaddafi, uh, but also because of the support uh, that you seemed at different times to give to the PLO. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Sigmund to, to stand now for a moment uh, and pose whatever question he would like directly to you. Mr. Sigmund? Before I pose my question, uh, permit me to say first that when I had the, the pleasure and honor of meeting with Mr. Mandela in Geneva, we said to him, and I would like to repeat this now in order to put my question in context, that the commitment of the Jewish organizations that met with him to the struggle against apartheid, against racism, against injustice in South Africa is absolutely unconditional. It is not dependent on whether we are happy or unhappy with responses that Mr. Mandela gives to some questions. Having said that, <laughs> having said that, I think I would be dishonest if I did not express profound disappointment with the answer that Mr. Mandela gave to the previous question because it suggests a certain degree of amorality. The, it suggests that the, what these people do in their own countries, what a Gaddafi does in Libya, what a, what a uh, Castro does in Cuba, is totally irrelevant even in terms of the issue of, of human rights as long as they support the cause of the ANC. I hope that is not what Mr. Mandela meant, and I would hope that he would clarify that issue further. Mr. Mandela. Firstly, we are a liberation movement which is fully involved in a struggle to emancipate our people from one of the worst racial tyrannies the world has seen. We have no time to be looking into the internal affairs of other countries. It is unreasonable for anybody to think that this is our role. I have been asked by somebody who wants me to express an opinion on the differences that are taking place within the USA. And he has made his position quite clear that there is racialism in this country. I have refused to be drawn into that. Why should Mr. Sigmund accept my refusal to be withdrawn into the internal affairs of the United States. And at the same time, want me to be involved in the internal affairs of Libya and uh, uh, Cuba. I refuse to do that. As far as Yasser Arafat is concerned, I explained to Mr. Sidney that we identify with the PLO because just like ourselves, they are fighting for the right of self-determination. Yeah. 
I went further, however, to say that the support for Yasser Arafat in his struggle does not mean that the ANC has ever doubted the right of Israel to exist as a state legally. We have stood quite openly and firmly for the right of that state to exist within secured borders. But, of course, as I said to Mr. Sigmund in Geneva and others, that we carefully define what we mean by secure borders. We do not mean that uh, Israel has the right to retain the territories they conquered from the Arab world, like the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and uh, the West Bank. We don't agree with that. Those territories should be returned to the Arab people. Mr. Mandela. I also explained to Mr. Sigmund and company, that in our organization, we have Jews. In fact, Mr. Gaddafi did not allow us to open our offices in Libya, precisely because we had the courage to say to him, we work with the Jews in our organization. And he didn't uh, allow us to open an office until February this year, when he had to accept us as we are. We are not prepared to be swayed by anybody. We have an independent policy which we are certain, no matter with whom we discuss. A number of the things that you said in uh, our hour between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock this evening, some controversial things, not the kinds of things necessarily that a very political man says. If you were very political, you might have been more concerned about not alienating some people in this country who have it within their hands, within their power, either to continue sanctions against South Africa or to raise those sanctions, to lift them. Why were you, why were you not a little more political? Perhaps we're too accustomed to politicians in this country. I do not understand what you mean. Perhaps uh, if uh, you clarify what you are referring to, I may be in a position to comment. What I'm saying <clears throat> is that in this country, for example, there has been for many years a close alliance between the Jewish population and the black population in the civil rights struggle. There is likely to be a rather negative reaction to some of the things that you have said. That reaction could very well cause people to call up their congressmen, their senators, and say, ah, go ahead, lift the sanctions. Why not? After all, President de Klerk is doing a great deal against apartheid. Only today, in fact, his number two man, Gerard Villeneuve, said that the government perceives itself in South Africa as being part of the anti-apartheid struggle. <laughs> One of the problems <clears throat> we are facing in the world today, are people who do not look at problems objectively, but from the point of view of their own interests. That makes things difficult, because once a person is not objective, it is extremely difficult to reach an agreement. One of the best examples of this is to think that because Arafat is conducting a struggle against the state of Israel, that we must therefore condemn him. We can't do that. It is just not possible for any organization of or individual of integrity 
to do anything of the sort. I don't also want to, want to leave second, the impression, uh, if, if I might just inter intervene with one point, I don't want to leave the impression that this is only going to be a Jewish black issue. There are a great many Cuban Americans in this country who will be just as offended by some of the comments you've made about Fidel Castro and Cuba. No, Mr. Coppell, I don't agree with you. I am saying that uh, it would be a grave mistake for us to consider our attitude towards Yasser Arafat on the basis of the interests of the Jewish community. We sympathize with the struggles of the Jewish people and their persecution right down the years. In fact, we have been very much influenced by the lack of racialism amongst the Jewish communities. In our own country, in the political trials that have taken place, when few lawyers were prepared to defend us, it has been the Jewish lawyers who have come forward to defend us. I myself, I myself was articled, I'm a lawyer by profession, and I was trained to become a lawyer by a Jewish firm at a time when few firms in our country were prepared to take blacks. <clears throat> and as I have said, we have many Jews, uh, members of the Jewish community in our struggle, and they have occupied very top positions. But that does not mean to say that uh, the enemies of Israel are our enemies. We refuse to take that position. You can call it being political or uh, a moral question, but uh, for anybody who changes his principles depending on whom he is dealing, that is not a man who can lead a nation. Apparently, Mr. Koppel, you have not listened to my argument. If you have done so, then you have not been serious in examining it. I have replied to one of our friends here that I have refused to be drawn into the differences that exist between various communities inside the USA. You have not commented that I am going to offend anybody by refusing to involve myself in the internal affairs of the USA. <clears throat> of the USA. <laughs> Why are you so keen that I should involve myself in the internal affairs of Cuba and Libya? No. I expect you to be consistent. I don't know if I have paralyzed you. No, 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 no. I... I'm afraid, Mr. Mandela, that, that paralysis does not set in quite that easily in my case. The point... Uh, <laughs> the point that I was trying to make, and, and clearly did not make uh, with any great success, but the point that I was trying to make 
is that you must not be misled by what is, after all, what in this country we call a hometown crowd. These people are very much with you. You have seen that. The people who come out to see you, the people who will come to Yankee Stadium to see you, the people who line the motorcade routes to see you, you don't have to convince them. They are people who already believe in you and believe in your cause. But this is a very large and diverse country. And when I was making my observations about the, the lack of politicism, and in this country saying someone is not a politician is not meant as an insult necessarily. Uh, when I was accusing you of a lack of, of political qualities there, I was wondering whether you are conscious of the impact that you will have on a great many people who are not here today, who do not see you in perhaps the same benign fashion that so many people in this audience see. Well, as far as the Jewish question to begin with, I have had the discussions at my own initiative with prominent Jewish leaders to straighten out this affair. Amongst the people I saw was Mrs. Helen Sussman, who has been an MP in our country for more than 30 years. There was Mr. Mazens, who has been a judge in Lesotho, Botswana, and the old Rhodesia. There was the chief rabbi of Johannesburg. There was Professor Katz from the University of Witwatersrand and an eminent uh, community leader in, in South Africa. We discussed this question and all misunderstanding was clear, the question of Yasser Arafat and the PLO. I have also discussed the question with uh, the Jewish leaders in the USA and very top people like Mr. Sigmund. We reached an agreement on this question and we saw eye to eye. Now, I don't know where your concern arises. The Jewish leaders themselves are able to determine their own affairs. Nobody else is entitled to say that uh, the Jewish leaders are going to be concerned about your stand. Let because me... I, just a minute, sure. Because I have had the discussions with them and those discussions will reach consensus. But uh, there are matters, of course, in which we did not agree. <clears throat> but uh, the position which we take as the ANC, I thought we were able to explain it in such a way that it removed the concern of the Jewish community. Let's broaden it up. I am still prepared to do that, even in this talk. If the Jewish leader have any doubts about our stand, I am prepared to address them and to allay uh, their concern because they are a very important community both in South Africa and of course in the States. And I'm prepared to iron out any differences that might exist, but they must know what our stand is. Arafat is a comrade in arm and we treat him as such. Allow me, Mr. Mandela, to broaden the subject out a little bit and to, to introduce now uh, another distinguished guest here, uh, Senator Boren, who indeed will be called upon very shortly to vote upon the issue of sanctions. Senator Boren, uh, I wonder if you'd be good enough to stand up and, and to give me your assessment of how much trouble do you think Mr. Mandela is going to have on this issue? How warmly will he be received in the U.S. Congress? Ted, I think he's going to be very warmly received by people in both parties and by the uh, administration as well. While there may be some differences of opinion on certain issues, uh, like uh, positions on Arafat and Gaddafi, I think the American people understand what has gone on in South Africa. We have seen families divided because they've been classified according to race. We know that people are denied the right to vote because of race. We know that people are detained and not even given a trial because of race. And the American people regardless of party or position on other issues, are not about to relieve the pressure until that system is changed. One question, Ted. I do think that many of us understand that there are pressures being exerted. 
that Mr. Mandela and President de Klerk, as they start toward negotiations, have extremists on both sides who really do not want to see them succeed, who do not want to see a peaceful transition. And we're concerned. I understand why we must not release the pressure, and I think there's a bipartisan decision not to do that. The President has reached out to us in Congress to say that he will consult with us on any uh, future policy decisions that are made. But I wonder if there are some positive signals we could send, positive to both Mr. Mandela and to Mr. de Klerk as well, that would reach out to help South Africa, that would show our encouragement for these negotiations, and that perhaps could help the country as it does move to a non-racial democracy. Can, perhaps you, can helping, you give us a, well, a perhaps, uh, Senator, and then have Mr. Mandela perhaps respond? Perhaps helping the schools. I know that uh, black children in school, only one out of every five even has a textbook because the past government has spent eight times as much educating white children as black children. Are there positive things we can do, Mr. Mandela, at this point to send a signal both to you and to Mr. de Klerk that we encourage progress in these negotiations that are going on? <clears throat> Well, Mr. Koppel, I think I would have an easier task if you ask me to pass a vote of thanks to Senator Bond. He has said all the things that are required to be said in regard to the problems of South Africa. He has a very positive attitude and uh, he is constructive. He is one of those men who are concerned not with fights only in his own country, in his own region. He is one of those men who have selected the world as a theater for their own efforts, for their own operations. And it is refreshing to be in the presence of such a man. 